Good evening, I'm Priscilla Wolf. In Yorkton, the bail hearing for the Cuzon sisters is wrapping up. The sisters say they were wrongfully convicted of the 1993 murder of a Saskatchewan farmer. After spending nearly 30 years in prison, support from advocates across the country is pouring in. Tamara Pimentel has the story. On day two of a bail hearing and on her 51st birthday, Adelia Cuisance looks back at a lifetime institutionalized. I was talking to my oldest daughter, Haley, and she was mentioning, she was like, wow, mom, you're 51 today and you were in prison 30 years and four or five years in a boarding school, so I've been confined most of my life. She and her sister, Narissa, arrived at the Yorkton Courthouse Wednesday with support from family and advocates, pushing for the two to be released after spending 30 years in prison for a murder their cousin confessed to. Advocates Nicole Porter and Dan Godberzin partnered with Change.org to create a petition to free the Cuisant sisters. They've so far received over 60,000 signatures. We wanted the country as a whole to know how many concerned citizens there are. Uh, and we would like to see ultimately uh, the Justice Minister in Saskatchewan make attempts at reconciliation here. So our big goal was to deliver uh, these signatures to her. Godrezin wasn't successful in submitting the petition while spending Tuesday outside the Saskatchewan legislature. But signatures are still rolling in from across the country and some from the states. I'm here for the sisters, the miscarriage of justice. This is 30 years and um, it's just deplorable. Senator Kim Pate used to be the executive director of the Elizabeth Fry Society supporting women in jail. She said she met the sisters when they were first incarcerated. So what's really important for people to know is all of those breaches in almost every case they were continuing to live their lives. They were contributing to the community. I mean, when, a, when Narissa was unlawfully at large for over two years, she was actually working with people in the downtown east side. She was sheltering animals and fostering them. She was, uh, she was working. She was not posing a risk to public safety. And that what the judge has to look at is, will releasing these two women on bail pending the review of their wrongful convictions result in a risk to public safety and the, I think the very clear answer is no. The judge won't be making a decision for at least another month but Azelia says she refuses to give up hope for a positive outcome. This should be reconciliation today and I only still believe in my heart that everything's gonna work out today and I just keep praying every day. My team wouldn't be here if they didn't believe we were innocent. Tamara Pimentel, ABTN National News, Yorkton. The details of the 1993 murder and trial were front and center at Wednesday's hearings. ABTN's Daniel Parody was there listening to the extensive testimony, including how the two sides saw the murder and trial in very different ways. Danielle, there were two competing messages at the bail hearing today. Let's start with what the sisters' lawyers were saying. What was the main argument? The main argument of the sisters' lawyers is that the sisters have been mistreated. Uh, there was a lot of focus on the fact that the police ignored a judge's order to remand them to a prison in Prince Albert and instead kept them in a local detachment where they were questioned uh, against the advice of their counsel. Uh, there was also a discussion on the treatment of Indigenous people and the way that we've interacted with the uh, judicial system and a focus on how uh, we know more about false confessions, uh, which uh, James Lockyer has said that that's what the sister's confession was, was a false confession. And, and now keeping in mind that false confession that we need to re-examine uh, the sister's case. Okay. So the Crown is using the sister's criminal history against them, but also going back to discuss the murder and trial. What message did Saskatchewan put forward? The Saskatchewan Prosecutor's Office focused on the sisters' uh, repeated breaches of parole and times that they were unlawfully at large, so times that they had left prison, um, to talk about community safety and whether or not that would be a concern, as well as a focus on the sisters' substance abuse issues both in the past and more recently. So did the judge have anything to say during today's testimony one way or the other? 
The judge hasn't uh, weighed in one way or another. We're still waiting on a decision. Uh, that'll be a few weeks from now. However, uh, before I left the court, the judge was saying that he would prefer more information about a release plan for the sisters before making a decision. What's next, Danielle? This was the last day of the hearing, and um, right now they're just discussing when they should reconvene to discuss the details of a release plan. So we won't see a decision for four to six weeks. Okay, well, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. We want to hear what you think about the exact story that you just saw. Here's how to continue the conversation. Send your emails to news at aptn.ca. Leave a comment on aptnnews.ca. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. Follow APTN News to join the conversation and see our latest stories. Time for our first break. We'll be right back. A possible case of gerrymandering has a Nova Scotia MP up in arms. It came as a, as, a, as a total shock and, and something that I never thought was possible. Liberal member of Parliament Jaime Baptiste is fighting changes to his Nova Scotia riding. A proposed redistribution will move the Eskasoni First Nation to another riding. It's the largest one in Nova Scotia and where Baptiste makes his home. Angel Moore met the MP in his Cape Breton riding. It came as a, as a, as a total shock and, and something that I never thought was possible. That's Jaime Baptiste's reaction that will see two Mi'kmaq communities, Wagnacook and Escazoni, move from his riding of Sydney, Victoria to a more rural one. And then without any consultation, without any words or any uh, involvement from Mi'kmaq communities to be then told, guess what, we're taking ma majority of, of the Mi'kmaq communities out of this riding. Elections Canada is housed in this building in Gatineau, Quebec. And every 10 years, a federal electoral boundaries commission recommends changes in riding borders in response to population distribution. The riding currently contains the northeastern part of Unamagi, Mi'kmaq for Cape Breton. Elections Canada is suggesting a smaller one be created, containing the urban communities of the Cape Breton Regional Municipality, while the new largely rural riding will house the two Mi'kmaq communities. Baptiste learned about the changes when the proposal was tabled in Parliament last November and questions what the Nova Scotia Boundaries Commission did. This is the area that's being excluded, mostly reserve land. And so how does someone make a boundary and say, we're going to keep this part of all the CBR except this part right here that includes what? The largest Mi'kmaq communities. Baptiste is the first Mi'kmaq person elected to Parliament. And if you look at it, it, it visibly seems like a Mi'kmaq community is being displaced once again after electing for the first time a Mi'kmaq member of parliament. 5,000 people live in the Eskazoni First Nation. It's just a 40-minute drive from Sydney. Eskazoni Chief Leroy Denny says his community was not consulted and is considering legal action. You know, this process should be stopped and be, and be consulted at least. At least, at least give us a say on this. And uh, we feel this is, could be a personal attack, nothing to do with the party or anything like that. It's, to me, it's, it's a Mi'kmaq representative that is affected, and it's affecting the Mi'kmaq community. Senator Dan Christmas of the Member 2 First Nation is the first Mi'kmaq appointed to the Senate, says the changes could hurt Baptiste's re-election challenges. It, it was all, it, to me, it's almost as if uh, this boundary review was guaranteeing that no Mi'kmaq person be elected as an MP by taking away their uh, voting base. Baptiste won re-election in 2021 by just over a thousand votes. He says all politicians are worried about winning elections, but that this proposed change is about not promoting Indigenous representation. And so, it, to me, it, it flies in the face of what Elections Canada have been saying for 20 years about 
creating more trust, creating more Indigenous participation, and within the first el electoral boundary thing that they put out in Nova Scotia, they dropped the ball. The Nova Scotia Federal Boundaries Commission told APTN News they will not provide any further information about the proposed change and Crown Indigenous Relations Office said the redistribution process is independent and Minister Mark Miller cannot comment. Baptiste has almost 40 signatures from MPs supporting his appeal. He will contest the proposed changes to his writings when the House of Commons Standing Committee on Procedure and House Affairs meets later this year. Angel Moore, APTN National News, Jabuktuk, also known as Halifax. The 20th Annual BC Natural Resource Forum kicked off in Prince George this week. First Nation leaders took center stage in panels on forestry and business. APTN's Lee Wilson has more. At the Natural Resources Forum, Premier David Eby announced a $90 million fund to help the forest industry. Last week, forestry company Canfor permanently closed the Prince George Mill, eliminating 300 jobs. In 2001, the province took steps to modernize BC forestry, including old growth protection and committing to government-to-government -government decision making along with First Nations. BC First Nations Forestry Council took part in a panel. They said industry and First Nations will need to work together to grow. You're looking at being able to survive and, and grow in a healthy way. You want good schools, you want paved roads, you want a hospital. You know, we also need that. So it is the together thing, and how do we move forward and find the solutions to survive? Well, we have to modernize. At the forum, Cheslata First Nation shared their challenges in successful collaborations with mining giant Rio Tinto. Other First Nations leaders had panel discussions on progressive Indigenous businesses. We will come chief Chris Roberts told industries in attendance that First Nations need to be included in projects because the land belongs to them. The recognition of our rights and our title and the fact that the territories where you're all operating, where you have an interest, where the government's been stepped in for the last 150 or 200 years to manage it, it is ours. It belongs to the nations and the territories where you live and play and work. And that acknowledgement, that recognition is the foundation that leads to how we're going to be a part of it. According to the B.C. government, natural resources such as forestry, fishing, mining and oil and gas extraction make up a large part of the province's economy. Clayton Tanay First Nation is the host nation for the BC Natural Resources Forum. Their chief, Darlene Logan, says they made a land declaration last year, but they are open for business opportunities and partnerships. Come see us, and I want them to all to be able to feel, to feel comfortable to come to the First Nations and say, hey, we're here. That's what I want out of this. I want them, I want the government and the industries to come to Clay Lutonay first. So this is Clay Lutonay's territory, as in our declaration, come to us first. The former will continue with talks on strengthening the natural resource sector workforce and bringing new investment into BC. Lee Wilson, AP10 National News, Kitimat. Time for another break. We'll be right back. Coming up after the break, a Saskatchewan First Nation athlete tries to wrestle his way into the big circuits. All Elite Wrestling, for those who might not know, they're the second biggest uh, TV wrestling company in North America behind the WWE. Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. Today's photo comes from Renee Dong, graphic artist here at AP10 News. She recently celebrated 10 years of service and was presented with a beautiful custom-made star blanket made by Little Buffalo Woman here in Manitoba. Congrats, Renee. If you want to be featured as our photo of the day, email your shots to share at aptn.ca. Now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. We'll start out east. It is 2 in Halifax and 0 in Charlottetown. It is four, minus 14 in Maine and minus 10 in Happy Valley Goose Bay. Minus 1 in Quebec City, minus 3 in Montreal. Plus 4 in London and 9 in Windsor. Minus 5 in Thunder Bay and minus 8 in Timmins. Minus 8 in Norway House and minus 9 in Thompson. 
minus eight in Winnipeg, and minus eight in Brandon. In Saskatchewan, it is minus seven in Esteban, minus six in Swift Current, minus five in Stony Rapids, and minus four in Buffalo Narrows. Minus three in Fort McMurray, minus two in High Level. Minus four in Medicine Hat, and plus two in Lethbridge. Plus five in Vancouver, and plus seven in Victoria. Minus one in Prince George, and plus one in Smithers. It's minus eight in Watson Lake, and minus 12 in Dawson. Minus six in Yellowknife, and zero in Trout Lake. It is minus nine in Colville Lake. Minus 12 in Chesterfield, and minus 11 in Baker Lake. It is minus 38 in Arctic Bay. The United States' biggest independent film festival, Sundance, is set to kick off tomorrow. And among its offerings this year is a documentary series exploring the murder and missing Indigenous women and girls crisis in Bighorn, Montana. Considered to be the most dangerous place in the country for Native American women. Here's Lindsay Richardson with a preview. Hi, Sundance. Every year, the film world's movers and shakers gather at the Sundance Film Festival. It's incredibly exciting being here. And set to premiere to a sold out crowd this year is a true crime documentary series on the topic we north of the border know well. Since colonization, Native women have been targeted. The three part series, Murder in Bighorn, explores MMIWG cases in the Crow and Northern Cheyenne reservations of Bighorn County, Montana. You can get killed real easily around here. The series is co produced by Blackfeet siblings Ivy and Ivan McDonald. While they'd been approached to collaborate on similar MMIWG projects before, Ivan told APTN News he found the true crime genre often leaning on sensationalism. Oh, is it a serial killer? Is it these like murderers prowling the reservation? Is it <laughs> people be like, oh, have you ever looked into Bigfoot or aliens? Like in, you know, just in serious, in, ser in, 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 in as serious as possible. This series really tries to focus on what is the humanity of these young women and girls? What is, you know, how do, how do communities, how do families just deal deal with this crisis in the wake of it. Canada has had its own reckoning with the MMIWG crisis in the last decade. Most recently, the federal government appointed Jennifer Rattray to create an ombudsperson's office to oversee application of the MMIWG Commission's 274 calls to action, while advocates across the country are keeping pressure on Winnipeg police to properly investigate a series of murders of homeless Indigenous women. I think Canada in some ways, for better or worse, has kind of at least broached the kind of national conversation. So I think within the United States, I think it's really, I think it really is kind of this newer topic, even in some Indigenous communities. The murder rate for women living on reservations in the U.S. is 10 times higher than the national average, but cases often go unsolved due to a lack of investigative resources available. Back in 2020, the Trump administration signed in the Operation Lady Justice Task Force to try and curb this issue. But there's an estimated 4,200 cold cases to dive into. That of McDonald's cousin is one of them. Our cousin Ashley Loring Heavy Runner had went missing on the Blackfeet Reservation, walking along um, kind of this desolate and kind of infamous highway um, that leads from our reservation up to Canada. And that was kind of the last last time she was seen. I think we've kind of have come to this realization that it is really kind of this deep-seated structural just, you know, injustice that these people face. While Heavy Runner's case isn't one of the four explored in the series, McDonald hopes that by identifying the colonial roots of the MMIWG issue, the jurisdictional challenges in investigating and exploring the widespread personal impact of these cases, the series will initiate new conversations, both inside Sundance screening rooms and beyond. Hopefully with this project, they just are able to kind of shift their worldview to kind of understand this, you know, Know, this this frame of reference, this frame of view, um, or worldview outside of their own, and kind of dive into that, um, you know, for a few hours and really kind of understand um, just some aspects of kind of the 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 multitude of indigenous experience. They can take our women, and nothing will happen.
After Murder in Bighorn premieres at Sundance, it will be available to stream online in early February. Lindsay Richardson, APTN National News, Montreal. Sebastian Wolf is Cree from the Pasqua First Nation in Saskatchewan. Recently, Wolf had his big break in the AEW, the All Elite Wrestling League. He's not officially on the AEW's roster yet, but he did compete on last week's fight card, which aired on the league's YouTube channel. Wolf says it was unexpected and he was called in at the last minute as an extra, but it was a dream come true for Wolf, who is 33. One of his opponents was Matt Hardy, a childhood hero. Wolf's three-on-three -three team lost the match, but now he's hoping to make it on the AEW's roster permanently. All Elite Wrestling, for those who might not know, they're the second biggest uh, TV wrestling company in North America behind the WWE. So it was a pretty big deal. They have national TV programs on weekly and... It's, uh, yeah, um, that came about, I had a connection there and they got in contact with me. On today's episode of In Focus, host Daryl Stranger talked to advocates who are out there to help those who are houseless. Here's what they said to helping those out who have nowhere to go. I think our city has been tremendous in, in having a desire to help, but they don't always know how, and they don't know, you know, you don't always have to create your own platform, but you can utilize existing ones. We've had some tremendous groups that have been existing for a long time doing what we call heart work. You know, an example is Mama Bear Clan, uh, Community 204. We all utilize social media. That's kind of the trend nowadays to get your message and spread that awareness. Right. You know, join those groups and kind of recognize the call outs that they put, you know, join in on things, join in on activism. Um, you know, realize that helping someone doesn't require much from you. Sometimes it's just time, sometimes it's effort. For some places, uh, you know, uh, people aren't biased the way they should be, you know. Um, if they know, you know, this certain uh, client or applicant or whatever, homeless person um, has a problem. Uh, they, don't, they don't address the problem, they address the person, which makes it harder for the person to try and get, you know, shelter. Um, it, it's, I think it's a missing link to a lot of our people's healing because uh, we go into the, we go into those comfort zones. Uh, it's a back alley, the doorway, or in, in our small, in our in our villages communities, we go into their their houses, knock on a door, or we pick them up out of the alley and say, "Come on, let's go for a coffee." Gain that trust because you know, that trust is a big issue, and you know we start we start from there. You know, I, I truly believe that uh, one small act of kindness can make a world of difference. You know, just say hello, check on somebody, you know, give them a hug, ask them how they're doing, not what they're doing. It's all an approach to things. You know, if we approach somebody with care, we're going to make a lot of difference. That's your show for tonight. I'm Priscilla Wolf. Have a great evening.